Well, hello everybody. I'm sorry to disappoint. I'm afraid I am not Nigel Farage. It's me, Patrick Christie, filling in for the great man for the next hour. However, I think we can all agree it's the role that I was born to play. I've been method acting for this. Yes, OK, maybe I had a nail or two. Maybe I've been chain smoking and maybe I used a picture of Ursula von der Leyen's face as a darts board earlier. So I think we can all agree that, frankly, I'm destined for this job. Now, we've got loads coming your way, actually. We're going to be analysing our new energy policy. Will going nuclear actually get us out of this cost of living crisis? Will it solve our problems? How do you feel about all of that? We're going to be joined by Harvey Proctor as well for Talking Pies. A colourful character, to say the least, with no little personal scandal to pick through as well. So it'll be interesting to get the latest from him. I'm seeing well done Boris Johnson as well. He's basically said that women are women, men are men, and men should not be taking part in women's sports. And you know what? It's about time somebody in politics did that. But first, it's latest news. Thanks, Patrick. I'm Simon Pusey in the GB Newsroom. Russia has been suspended from the UN Human Rights Council with the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss saying the country is now a global pariah. The United Nations General Assembly saw 93 countries vote in favour of the move, while 24 were against. 58 countries abstained. The Foreign Secretary says the mounting evidence of war crimes in Ukraine means Moscow can no longer have a seat at the table. Russia has described the suspension as illegal and politically motivated. Meanwhile, NATO members have agreed to supply new and heavier weapons to Ukraine. Kiev says it needs immediate reinforcements against Russia or it will be too late. Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has confirmed that a wide range of weapons are being sent to the country. And the allies are providing them with different types of weapons and we see the impact uh, of uh, these weapons uh, on the battleground every day uh, because the Ukrainians have been able to inflict severe uh, losses on uh, the invading Russian uh, forces. In other news, the Prime Minister has defended the government's energy strategy after Labour criticised the plan as being too little too late. The government says it wants to reduce the UK's dependence on overseas oil and gas by creating more nuclear, wind, solar and hydrogen power facilities. Under the plan, up to eight nuclear reactors will be delivered by 2030. Visiting Hinkley Point C, Boris Johnson said the strategy is about making sure the UK is never blackmailed by people like Vladimir Putin again. This is about tackling some of the, uh, the mistakes of, of the past and making sure that we are, are set well for the future. Uh, we're no longer subject to, uh, we're never again subject to the, the vagaries of the uh, global uh, oil or gas price. We can't be subject to blackmail, uh, as it were, from uh, people such as Vladimir Putin. We have energy security here in the UK. The man accused of murdering Sir David Amos has told jurors he decided to kill the MP because he voted for airstrikes on Syria. Ali Harbi Ali told the court he had no regrets, saying, if I thought I did anything wrong, I wouldn't have done it. The South End West MP was stabbed to death during a constituency surgery in Essex in October last year. The defendant has denied murder and preparing acts of terrorism. And a security guard who worked at the British Embassy in Berlin has denied spying for Russia. David Smith, who was extradited from Germany, pleaded not guilty to nine offences under the Official Secrets Act at Westminster Magistrates Court. He's due to reappear at the Old Bailey next week. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Patrick. Good evening, everybody. Yes, Patrick Christie's here, filling in for the legend himself, Nigel Farage, who will be back very soon. Don't worry about that. Right. I find it absolutely toe-curling that politicians can't answer the simple question of what is a woman. It's adult human female. That's that. That's it. No need for anything else. Time and time again, we see politicians dodge the question of what is a woman. Even female MPs. I'm staggered by that. I would have thought that more women would be sticking together on this and defending their gender, their spaces, their sports. But they're too scared. Why? Because of the trans mafia. Some people may think the word mafia is too strong, but I don't. Just think about how the flag and pronoun in Bio Brigade behave when someone doesn't toe their line. They want to ruin you completely. They want you to lose your job and never work again. They want your partner to leave you, for you to become a social pariah. They call you names, they label you a turf. 
So in light of that kind of behaviour, well, well done, Boris Johnson. Our Prime Minister actually said what, frankly, most of us are thinking. He doesn't think transgender women should compete in female sporting events. Good. That's common sense. You end up with situations like we're seeing in America with swimmer Leah Thomas, where a man is swimming female sporting events. Women who have worked their entire lives to get the best out of their abilities and compete at an elite level are having their moments of glory snatched away from them by a bloke. But Boris went one step further than that. He was on a roll. He said, I also happen to think that women should have spaces, whether it's in hospitals, prisons or changing rooms, which are dedicated to women. Yet more common sense here, isn't it? It defies all logic to allow a man into a female changing room, regardless of whether or not they're transitioning. It is an unnecessary risk and a needless one at that. We all know that Boris Johnson loves women. Sometimes he's loved too many of them and potentially loved them a bit too much. But he's actually the only leader of a political party who is standing up for women's rights right now. He's the only one who doesn't seem to be actively propelling us towards the erasure of womankind. The suffragettes didn't throw themselves in front of horses so a man can tell them what a woman is. It doesn't make political sense either. The trans community is not large enough to swing an election, probably wouldn't even swing a seat, to be honest. And plenty of members of the LGBT community aren't on board with it. The fact is that our politicians, the arts, some sports and the education system is being held hostage by a very angry, vocal minority of people. But not Boris Johnson, apparently. He's come out, for want of a better phrase, and said what millions of us know to be true. Being a woman is more than just a feeling. So tonight, I'm asking you, is Boris Johnson actually a feminist prime minister? Get in touch via Farage at gbnews.uk or hashtag Farage on GB News. Right, so I look forward to picking through all of those. I'm sure they're going to be coming in thick and fast. In fact, I've got the inbox in front of me now and I can already see a couple there. So well done, very quick off the draw there. But moving away from that for now, the government and Boris Johnson has announced his much-anticipated energy plan after a number of delays. So it includes aims for eight nuclear reactors, including two at Sizewell in Suffolk and an increase in wind, hydrogen and solar production. So as the people of this country face soaring energy bills, the government plans for up to 95% of the UK's electricity to come from low carbon sources by 2030. Well, Clive Moffat joins me now. He's recently been advising the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy on this energy policy and is founder of the UK Energy Security Group. So I think you can all agree there is probably nobody better to get on than this. Look, I don't claim, and I, you know, I have to be very honest about this, I don't claim to be the most clued up person in the world when it comes to the energy sector. It's very complex and there's a lot of different elements to it. And so I'm really hoping you might be able to, to educate me on this. Break it down for people. Is this going to save us money? I'm afraid uh, it amounts to another political gesture. A lot of wishful thinking about the targets for massive targets now for nuclear and wind. And to be honest with you, to be frank, that the, what has been announced will have no material Im improvement in the security of supply of power or heat to consumers and industry. And what it will do is increase the bills before any of this new electricity was, is ever generated. Consumers and industry will be paying massively billions of pounds in bills and taxation uh, to fund uh, the, uh, this new capacity. Uh, and the next 10, 20 years are critical. Um, I was reassured by some mention about gas. We've had very little mention of the importance of gas in the transition to net zero. Yeah. Net zero target being 2050, which may... OK, all right, all right. So just, 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 just break this down then. So if this isn't going to work and it's going to cost us more money, why are we doing it? And also just break down exactly why it won't work. OK, um, we're, well, they're doing it because they feel committed still. There is still a, uh, a majority in Westminster who believe that the net zero target should remain and everything should be done to try and achieve it, even though they're for technical reasons and for cost reasons, it may not be practical or viable. Um, you asked me a question about what should we do instead? 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. That's that, that's the thing. I want to know. Well, frankly, I'm not sure why we haven't just sacked off the whole uh, push. Well, why push work? Let's theory, just but yeah. Well, what would we do? The, what would we do the, instead? The, the why on nuclear is that there is no nuclear plan. I mean, Hinkley is the current new one. It won't be due out until 2026, and the cost of 23 billion. If you add up another six half a dozen of those, they will be delayed. And the cost is enormous. And on this time, rather than giving a price subsidy after the thing is built, the Chancellor has decided that we will actually contribute up to 20, 25% of the actual cost, which is almost an open-ended commitment. And the other thing is on wind, the growth in wind target is, is, is extremely large. Most of it's going to be offshore. Turbines cost more money offshore. They're less reliable. They still have the problem of wind as intermittent. And there is a problem of transmission cost because most of the offshore uh, installations are away from the centers of demand and require huge input into new investment in transmission, which is simply not there. OK, right. I mean, so it does just seem like yet another kind of well, not even a sticking plaster, really. I suppose the wound is still gushing, isn't it? But yeah. uh, Boris Johnson clearly doesn't seem like, like he's capable now anyway of being able to fix this particular issue. So, realistically, people care about the pounds in their pocket. Can you see a situation where, really, people are essentially working just to pay their heating and just to pay their bills as opposed to actually having any kind of spare cash or knocking about whatsoever? I think the first thing to say here is in the very short term, there's nothing we can do about mitigating the impact of increasing energy costs. That is not to say that energy costs can't be mitigated in the future. And what we should be looking at is saying if heat and if gas is still going to be important, which it is in heat and power, what could we do to actually mitigate volatility in the next 10, 20 years? Okay. in energy costs and as well as undermine as well as underpinning security and i think there is a case and we didn't hear it today for more gas generation which could or could not have carbon capture and storage attached to it we need more flexible okay. peaking plant to 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 actually adjust to the intermittency of wind and solar okay now clive i hate to do this but you've got to explain yourself, OK? You've recently been advising the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. They've not done what you're suggesting. Why haven't they listened to you? Well, it's interesting that you say that. Last week we had a conversation. I shan't name who I spoke with. Name him. But uh, we had a conversation, and the conversation was about what could we do to mitigate the impact, possible impact, of energy rationing in the next winter starting in October. And the answer is not a lot. And there are some things that can be done in terms of demand gas management and in terms of increasing storage. But no, you can't do that overnight. So there is not a lot we can do in the very, very short term. The other question they had was, what could we do in the medium term to improve security? And the answer is more storage, more production of gas probably more fracking to reduce import dependency. Yeah. And in the next 10 years, these are the sorts of measures that we should be looking at uh, in at the same time as having maybe an increase in wind generation capacity. But I think the nuclear, whether it be large nuclear, whether it be small modular nuclear, is simply an uneconomic proposition. Yeah, indeed. Well, look, Clive, I've enjoyed every moment of this. Thank you very much, Clive Moffat there who, of course, has been recently advising the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Sadly, they decided to do something completely different, but there we go. And, of course, he's the founder of the UK Energy Security Group. Part of me wants to get some, maybe some fake oil tankers or some fake tankers at these fracking sites and allow the Just Stop Oil lot to just tie themselves to them. And then we just leave them there. Right. Earlier today, the United Nations voted to boot Russia out of the Human Rights Council. It came after a number of allegations of atrocities committed by Russian soldiers during the war. Ukraine has said that Russia's actions would be equated to war crimes and crimes against humanity. Around 1,200 war crimes have been registered in the Kiev region, which is, I mean, a heck of a lot, isn't it? Let's be honest. And Putin's regime has been accused of raping Ukrainian citizens and even using children as human shields. With me now to get some clarity on this is James Johnston, 
international humanitarian law barrister at global counter-corruption company Pavacat, and, of course, a war crimes expert. Thank you very much. I can see your, your background there. It is befitting of a man of your stature. I, I do thoroughly enjoy that. Um, well, I mean, let's get down to it. What constitutes a war crime? Well, if you want to ask about war crimes, it really is contrary to what President Putin and his generals may think. Uh, war crime is, in fact, a fact regulated by law. Um, and this is international humanitarian law, laws of war, laws of armed conflict. And what they really come down to is two conventions, the Geneva Convention, which sets out effectively how to rules protecting civilians, uh, the wounded and so on. So it's, it's really looking at the victims of war. And you have the Hague Convention, the Conventions, and these are rules dealing with the methods uh, and means of conducting war. So those two come together. And what this means is that serious or grave breaches of international humanitarian law, they account as war crimes. They are able to be prosecuted in the international criminal, uh, under international criminal, court, uh, criminal law. Um, and they include, here, what's the idea of war crimes? Torture, murder, hostage taking, uh, the use of, of civilians as human shields, uh, forced abduction, wanton uh, destruction of property. You know, all the kind of things that we are seeing on our screens at the moment taking place in the Ukraine. Right, so, so it would appear, at least from what we are seeing, that there's, there's the potential there, I suppose, for it. Definitely. How likely, however, is it that Russia or Putin or any general or whatever will be held accountable? Because surely there's always deniability with these things. I mean, Putin can say, can't he? Hey, I didn't order this. This has nothing to do with me. I'm not sure it's entirely a question of, of deniability. I think you have a, a bigger problem here is that first of all, war crimes take a, a long time to investigate, a long time to prosecute. We, we've seen that before in, in previous conflicts. But there is an international criminal justice system. It does exist. And people can be tried for war crimes. And they can, if they're convicted, they can be prosecuted. But you have a problem here. The system is um, centred on the International Criminal Court. This was set up in 1998. Uh, it's called the Rome Statute. But there's a problem. Russia is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court, and it doesn't accept the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction. So the problem that you've got right. here is that right. whilst you may find that there's a successful prosecution, Patrick, uh, is it likely that you're going to get Putin or another president uh, similar to him being prepared to extradite people to face justice in The Hague, or even likely to go and courts martial their own uh, soldiers, their own uh, armed personnel back in Russia? That seems extremely unlikely at present. It does indeed. Look, just lastly, and yeah, absolutely, you know, it's, well, it's a morbid topic we're talking about, isn't it? And it's a rather morbid way to finish. But increasing reports coming out from various different Ukrainian cities about Russian troops raping women and, in some cases, potentially even children as, as well. It's harrowing stuff. It's horrific stuff. One would assume that they can't... Well, probably none of them are lying, but, you know, they can't all be lying. Certainly can they? It looks as though that's happening. Is that a war crime? That's just a crime, is it? To a rape, yeah. looting, pillage, that's, that's, that, that is all potentially a war crime. But there's ah, a, right. the problem here, if you've got time, Patrick, there's a problem yeah, go that we've on. got here at the moment. A lot, well, a lot of effort has been made uh, at the moment. You're seeing it uh, all over the place. Lots of initiatives and great proposals from people like Gordon Brown. There are uh, countries coming in like the United States, the UK, the USA, and uh, Canada, and so on. But what we're not seeing is no one's got a grip on this. No one's got a grip on the situation. And it seems at the moment, with respect to be, to sort of, it's not yet integrated. What I'm really keen to see is an integrated, coherent, coordinated uh, proposal put together to bring everything under one roof, effectively. And what we're proposing is an international uh, legal assistance uh, headquarters for Ukraine. Ah. So that, personally, what I'd be calling upon, what I'd like to do is, is, is really to, to ask Dominic Raab, our Minister of Justice, Sola Braveman, the Attorney General, to convene as soon as possible an international legal summit. And the purpose behind that is to get one lead nation, and this can be done online, one lead nation at that summit, to then take responsibility, to then host that uh, headquarters in its capital, and then to bring together everything under one roof. So you're not seeing lots of different countries doing lots of different things, but everything being coordinated in one place. So getting back to it, Patrick, the simple point is we need to get a grip. We do need to get a grip, and I, I really hope that, that that works out. It sounds like you are the man for this particular crisis. Uh, did you say that you've spoken to Dominic Raab about this, or you're trying to? Basically, this is what we would like to see happen. Okay. I mean, my colleagues and I have been advocating this for the past few weeks, so this is something that really should be taking place. It's not just legal. It's legal, it's the reputational issue. It's actually making it clear to people in Russia 
to Putin and his uh, military leaders and political leaders and so on. But there's an international reputational issue here, as well as the prosecutorial side, as well as the investigatory side. Yeah, absolutely. Hammer it home from as many different angles as physically possible. James, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Lovely to talk to James Johnston there. International humanitarian law barrister at global counter-corruption company Pavacat, and, of course, a war crimes expert. Interesting that, and that made a lot of sense, I think, there, about having one kind of united body there that can oversee all of this. But coming up, Rishi Sunak is under fire. But is it deserved? We'll talk about all of that after the break. Don't go anywhere. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Well, hello, everybody. Yes, Patrick Christie is here in for Nigel Farage. Now, at the top of the show, I asked you, is Boris Johnson a feminist PM? And you've got in touch. Look, a bit of context here, of course. It was that Boris Johnson came out, really, and frankly said what I think millions and millions and millions of us also agree with, which is that basically women are women and men should not be taking part in female sport. And he also doubled down. He said, didn't he? that women should have their own safe spaces, so they should have, you know, things in hospitals, for example, prisons as well. Again, bit of common sense. Well, you've got in touch. One viewer says, it's nothing to do with feminism, just the facts of life, as the majority know them to be true. And there wasn't a name on that one, I don't think. But, yes, if you do get in touch, do try to leave your name. It'd be nice to give you a little shout-out. Another viewer says, it's just right. Don't complicate it. All right, then. I won't. Bill says... Why is it feminist to state the obvious? There's a theme here, isn't there, people? I think, look, my overbearing point here, Bill, is that I think Boris Johnson's now, currently, the only leader of a major party who is standing up for women, right? Keir Starmer there appears not to be able to clearly define what a woman is. He doesn't seem to be particularly bothered about women-only spaces, safe spaces, female sports, for example. And I find that very, very strange. The Liberal Democrats, well, we all know how they feel about it. In fact, Ed Davey just flat-out refuses to answer the question whether or not he thinks a woman can have a penis, which I find absolutely shocking. Although, to be fair, coming from the bloke who decided to show his solidarity with the Muslim community by eating bacon to end his Ramadan fast, I think we've come to expect some pretty idiotic stuff. John says, maybe he is. This is Boris Johnson being a feminist. But with his history of U-turns, he might not be tomorrow. I like that one, John. Yeah, OK, all right, fair enough. Yes, maybe Boris Johnson will row back on this after reconsidering and rethinking. Russell said, women should have their own spaces and men should have their own too. Well, I mean, there is this argument, isn't there, actually, that, OK, if you're a woman who's transitioning into manhood and, you know, do you end up in a, in a male changing room, in a male 
toilet. I suppose there, and whether this is correct or not, I suppose, reading between the lines, there feels as though there's more of an inherent risk from a man in a woman's space than it does from a woman in a man's space, I suppose. Anyway, keep these views coming, of course, for our at gbnews.uk. Now, Rishi Sunak has come under increasing pressure this week. First, for donating more than £100,000 to Winchester College, which, by the way, I don't see what the problem with that is, but anyway, the £43,000 a year private school, which is one he attended. I believe he was head boy. Then the Chancellor was told to come clean on his family's financial affairs after it emerged his wife benefits from a tax-saving scheme. So, Akshata Murthy has non-DOM status meaning she does not have to pay UK tax on income earned abroad. Miss Murthy earns money from shares in an Indian software giant founded by her billionaire father. So her spokeswoman said that she pays all the tax that's due in the UK. Well, joining me now to just pick through this, really, is John Cullinane, Tax Policy Director at the Chartered Institute of Taxation. Thank you very much for joining me on the show, John. There he is. Good stuff. Right, OK. Look, let's, we'll deal with the, with the non-DOM stuff. Uh, second, right? I just wanted to, to get something out of the way first about Rishi Sunak's £100,000 donation, which apparently was given to Winchester College so that actually children who, the phrase is, otherwise would not necessarily have the opportunity, either couldn't afford to go, I suppose, would get the opportunity to have a first-rate education. That, to me, is just a story about a man doing what he wants with his own money, isn't it? Well, I guess there'd be the question of tax relief, um, you know, both for the, for the college and for uh, himself. Um, but, you know, that would be a kind of normal application of the rules. Um, so, you know, people are either in favour of there being tax relief uh, for charities or private schools classif being classified as charities, or they're not. But, you know, th that, that's the current law and, uh, uh, you know, that would be fine. OK, all right. Well, let's, let's, get, let's get stuck into the old non-DOM stuff then. So I think for people listening on radio or viewing us at home now, it might be worth just a little, a little brief explanation, really, of, of what actually is going on here. What is the actual setup then? Well, I, you can, normally speaking, uh, in most countries in the world, you pay tax if you're resident in the country or if you have income that can derive from that country. Um, but if, even if you're resident in the UK, we have these special rules for so-called non-DOMs. So residence is looking at it like year by year. Domicile is kind of where you ultimately feel your loyalty is or where you feel you're from. And uh, so a, a number of people, um, yes, they may hear, maybe here for a long time, um, but ultimately they kind of feel they belong somewhere else and uh, that the domicile concept reflects that and there is just a favorable treatment in our tax system uh, that means they only pay tax on income from abroad if they actually bring it into the UK so if they don't they don't generally pay tax now that principle's been cut back a bit over the years and uh, it got it's all got very complicated but that's the essence of it it is not a bit of a slap in the face to ordinary Brits who are seeing their energy bills go through the roof, the cost of living crisis, fuel, food, everything, frankly, seems to be costing more money, and not everyone is earning more money. Is this not a bit of a slap in the face for them? The optics of it are pretty bad, aren't they? Well, I think probably the issue really is about the rules, you know, whether people uh, accept the rules or not. Um, successive governments have looked at it. In, in general, they've tended to kind of roll back a bit on the generosity of the relief. Uh, but on the whole, they've kind of always kept it going because I suppose they reckon it's better to have some very wealthy people here paying a bit of tax than, you know, maybe uh, d disincentivize them from coming to the UK at all. So but I, I don't know that public opinion has ever been that comfortable with that judgment. And I don't know that governments have ever put it in those stark terms. <laughs> that's the judgment. That's the judgment they're making. So um, it's not. Yeah. Um, it's not a kind of tax scheme in that anything uh, he or his wife have dreamt up. It's just the, uh, benefiting from the way the rules have, have uh, been and making you know making the claims accordingly. Well, so then again, this is it. And, and I dare say, you know, if Rishi Sunak is as wealthy as everyone seems to think he is and his, and his wife is, well, presumably he is still paying quite a lot of tax, one would have thought. Well, yes, I, I would imagine so. I mean, obviously, I have no idea how much tax they're paying. Exactly. But, uh, yeah. but, that, but that's the point, though, isn't it? And I think, there's, you know, we have to be aware of what kind of society we live in and what kind of society we want to live in, you know? We cannot 
relentlessly tax people, wealthy people, up to the eyeballs, because then, frankly, you don't tend to have very many wealthy people, and if you do, then they don't tend to be in this country. But just lastly, a little bit off the tax topic, I suppose, but it's more of your opinion, really. Do you think he's too rich to be Prime Minister? Do you think people will feel as though he's out of touch? Well, I, I think that, that... I mean, that is a political question. It's not a question of... You, you, no, you of need, need to be an expert on people will have their own views. Um, I think people... Uh, there have been some very wealthy people and uh, have been Prime Minister or the Chancellor of the Exchequer or other ministers, and uh, it's not been an issue. And there have been, um, equally, there have been others who haven't been particularly wealthy. So I kind of think it's the sort of, in, it, 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 you, there's stuff about who you are and there's stuff about kind of what you do and the signals you give off. And people have to look at the situation in the round, I think. Yeah, no, fair enough, absolutely. Well, look, thank you very much for your time and your insight as well. Great to have you on the show, John. John Cullinane there, Tax Policy Director at the Chartered Institute of Taxation. How do you feel about this as well? You know, do you feel as though it is a bit of a kick in the teeth? I'm a bit conflicted about the Rishi Sunak stuff because the rules are the rules and he doesn't appear to have broken any of them. He is a wealthy man. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't see why. It seems that it, to me anyway in this country now we have a, a push to almost hate people who create wealth and do well for themselves. It's a shame, really, I think, that, isn't it? We need to incentivise people to be wealthy. We can't be taxing them all to the absolute hilt, can we? So I'm a bit conflicted about this because, let's be honest, it does look pretty bad, doesn't it, at the same time as we're all cutting our cloth, as it were, Rishi Sunak and his wife anyway. Well, his wife is, well, not necessarily paying as much tax as they could, I suppose. But my first What the Farage story is a proper what the Farage moment. That's right, a shift in turn. It comes from America and the revelation that an F-18 pilot who filmed a famous 2015 UFO encounter gave secret evidence to politicians when he explained they initially thought the flying object was just part of training and locked into it like he was about to fight it. <laughs> so, new redacted documents. There he is. We can see footage of it there. If you are listening on radio, um, basically, it's, well, it's, it's uh, kind, of those kind of black and white kind of images that you see in, in airplanes there. And it's a little, I don't know, almost, you could say an almost tic-tac-shaped thing, I suppose. And it's been locked on. You can watch us on YouTube, remember, as well, so if you really want to see it. But basically, it's a UFO. Now, new redacted documents released to government document re repository, which is difficult for me to say, apparently. The Black Vault revealed that the pilot who encountered an unexplained aerial phenomena off the coast near Jacksonville, Florida, known as the Gimbal sighting, briefed Senate staffers in 2019 on the event. So it said, towards the end of one of the night flights, an unknown person was conducting during the sea period... He and his pilot detected an air contact coming from the east and heading towards the ship. Initially thinking it may be a simulated advisory aircraft as well as part of the Comtuex scenario, whatever that means, he took a look at the investigate uh, looked to investigate it further. The footage shows a strange wingless, tailless object on the aeroplane's video cameras. Gosh. Maybe they really are here. Maybe they are amongst us. I don't know. What do you think about all of this stuff? These things keep happening. There's the USS Nimitz, which is uh, oh, it's a big boat. And people kept seeing uh, UFOs off that. It's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And I've actually interviewed the master at arms of the USS Nimitz. It seems like he's got his head screwed on to me. I'd be very, very surprised if all of this was some kind of, some kind of big myth. But anyway, there we go. Another What the Farage. Prince Harry. Would have been safer coming to Britain for his grandfather's memorial service than going to Holland for the Invictus Games in a fortnight. That is according to the senior police officer who protected him and his mother. Now, they say that the Duke of Sussex has made the decision to cross the Atlantic for The Hague shortly after refusing to be with his British family at Westminster Abbey 10 days ago. So, he'll be in the Netherlands for the international sports competition for injured or sick military personnel and veterans from across the globe, which takes place from April the 16th to the 22nd. Of course, elsewhere, his darling wife, Megan, has attempted to trademark the word archetypes. You know that word that no one uses apart from her pretty much in the title of her first podcast series for the streaming giant Spotify? The word that has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, she really does just see something and want it, doesn't she? I think, although, to be fair, she did get that with Harry. But, uh, no, I want to know what you think about this as well with, with Harry. I'm less bothered about Megan trademarking the word archetypes. I just think that's par for the course with her, isn't it? But with Prince Harry, I was very, very, very angry about that. I was very angry that he didn't come back for Prince Philip's memorial service. I was very angry, of course, that, you know, he'd left the Queen there yet again, didn't he? Sitting there without 
her grandson, and I just thought it was an absolutely massive slap in the face, not just to our royal family, but to us as a nation, actually. There's plenty of people who feel like they've grown up with Harry, who've seen him since he was a child, who've loved him, who've cried tears when he's cried tears, who've laughed with him when he's laughed, who've loved him, supported him and helped him out. And actually, now, what's the point? Why did he, why did he not mu mu muster the courage to be able to come back? I think that's absolutely disgraceful. He's absolutely disgusting. And, yeah, if he thinks he's safe for in Holland, then fair enough, or maybe he should just stay there. Anyway, French far-right presidential candidate Marine Le Pen has vowed to issue fines to Muslims who wear headscarves in public. Yeah. As candidates made a final push for votes, three days ahead of an election scene is increasingly close. President Emmanuel Macron appears to have built up a lead of the first round of the polls on Sunday, but the latest poll suggests that Marine Le Pen is closing the gap. So she said, people will be given a fine in the same way that it's illegal not to wear your seatbelt. It seems to me that the police are very much able to enforce this measure. Where do you stand on that? I think it seems a bit strange for me, really. I don't see what the necessity... I'm not, you know, trying to come across as some kind of bleeding-heart liberal here, of course, but I don't see what the necessity is to stop people wearing headscarves in public. I don't, I don't get that, to find them. And, look, I, I'll be massively concerned about what this means going forward. This, I reckon, will lead to a load of terror attacks. Now, yes, all right, so we can raise some certain questions there about why a particular level of offence in one community may lead to a terror attack in, uh, in a way that perhaps it doesn't in other communities. OK, fine, that's a different question. But, actually, is there a necessity to fine people for wearing a headscarf in public? I'm not sure there is, but I suppose you can get in touch with that and let me know what you think. But some more of your reaction to my question right now, then, is Boris Johnson a feminist PM? Chris says, Boris is a feminist, I think, and for once he's making sense. This is after Boris basically said that women are women and men shouldn't be involved in women's sports. Transgender men shouldn't be involved in women's sports. Why would anyone even consider voting for a political party that can't even identify what a woman is? And that's Debbie. Cracking point, Debbie. I've said the same thing myself many, many times. If you cannot answer the question, what is a woman, you should be absolutely nowhere near power. It's as basic as that. Freddie says, Boris is right. There are only two genders. Yep, fair enough. Brian says... You don't have to be a feminist to have common sense, yes, OK. And John's been into... We've had a few Johns already here. It comes to something when we have to congratulate him on stating the obvious. Fantastic stuff. Yes, OK, all right. Thank you, everyone, who's been getting in touch. These emails are flooding in thick and fast. Keep them coming. Now, we are going to be doing talking pints, actually, with a legend, a real character. A real institution, in a way. He's had ups, he's had downs, he's been in the spotlight, he's been out of the spotlight. He's certainly back in it tonight. It's former Conservative MP Harvey Proctor. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already, a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 
150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Well, good evening, everybody. Yes, I've always wanted to cover this show because I get to go to the bar, don't I, after this. So Talking Pints with Harvey Proctor is up right now. Former Conservative MP, a real character, a man who's had a, a, a fascinating career, a fascinating life. Harvey, thank you very much for joining us here. Cheers to you as well, my good man. I hope you're and keeping cheers well. Cheers to you Thank too. you very yes, much. I must say, this is very civilised. They don't let me do this on my normal show, 10am until midday, for mm. obvious reasons. But um, but there we go. Bad luck, I'll just drink after a cheers. Good. Mm. Right, so look, thank you very much for coming in. I mean, it's difficult to know where to start with, with you, really. I mean, I think let's start with the kind of infamous issues that, that took place, you know, back in the day, I suppose, 1986, 1987. And just run our, our, our viewers and our listeners as well through what, what happened, really. And, and I understand that you want to kind of maybe set the record straight a little bit. Well, in 1986-87, um, I was prosecuted um, on four charges of gross indecency. I was and am a homosexual. I don't promote that, but it's just a matter yeah. of fact. And in those days, the age of consent for homosexuals was unequal in that heterosexual age of consent was 16, homosexual was 21. There was also a lacuna in the law between heterosexual and homosexuals, and that is in the homosexual area of the law. If you thought that the person you beam with was genuinely over the age of consent, but in fact they were one day under, yeah. you automatically committed an offence in the homosexual case, Goodness, but not in the heterosexual case. And therefore, in those years, I became a, 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 a demon, right. a, a devil incarnate. And there were a number of reasons behind that, which I, I don't think truly came out, okay. not just the law, um, but that I crossed uh, a chap who was a publisher then, Robert Maxwell. Yes. yes. And infamous. Robert Maxwell, the infamous Robert Maxwell, uh, didn't like me because I defeated his friend in Basildon in 1979 and won Basildon with the largest yeah. swing in England to take a, a seat in 1979. Uh, he didn't like me for that. He didn't like me because I'd sued one of his newspapers for libel and won. Right. And um, I thought it was not right for a publisher of a newspaper not just to try his papers to report the news, but to make the news by putting 20 reporters down into my constituency <laughs> to try to persuade them to vote against me in my executive council oh, wow. meetings. Now, oh. Robert Maxwell, not normally, this is not normally known, he pretends to be Jewish. Right. He was not Jewish. It was Jewish when he thought it was in his interests. Right. He's as Jewish as a bacon sandwich. Right. Now, it's about time that somebody actually said that, and I said it tonight. Well, I'm, 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 glad, you, I'm, glad, you, uh, I'm glad you did, of course. And Look, I, I, it's, a, it's an amazing sign of how times have changed, isn't it, really? The way that you were vilified, like you said, demonised, really, for, well, you know, I suppose, expressing your sexual preferences. Um, in private. In private. In private, not uh, proselytising uh, the case at all. And, of course, that then lost me my job, a job that I thought uh, was an honourable thing to be yeah. a member of Parliament. Of course, most people are subjected, perhaps, maybe, in their life to one scandal. I have been placed in the unique position, I think, of experiencing two pretty major yes. public scandals, because then it went on to um, Operation Midland. Absolutely. Um, seven or eight years ago. And there I became pariah. 
because I was accused of being a serial murdering child um, um, murderer and abuser. Which is, let's be honest, as bad as it gets, right? Well, you can't say anything worse about a human no, being it's than impossible. that. And, of course, the police came out and said that was credible, credible and, true. and true. Credible and true. When and you so, just, for just... a second mm. time, I this time lost my home, oh. my job and my repute. So, uniquely positioned now to deal with people who have lost their reputation damage to their reputation through false allegations and by misconduct by the police, because it still goes on. And I'm uniquely placed, I think, mm. uh, to help people now who have similar sort of problems. And indeed, uh, may be interesting to your viewers to know yeah. that I've already uh, been approached and helped high-profile individuals who've had similar, but not the same, uh, damaging right. uh, um, things made against them for their reputation. And also I've helped people who perhaps don't have a voice or a private wallet yes. who have also been um, falsely accused. Would you be able to give us a couple of examples? or? Well, perhaps not in terms of names, mm. but um, I, I am prepared knowing the difficulties of going through such horrendous times yeah. to try where I can to help those, whether they're in the public eye or not, if they are falsely accused. OK, just talk to me a bit about what that was like on an emotional level for you. I cannot imagine anything worse than being accused of the kind of things that you were accused of. And to then have the credible and true elements of it, there is a strange part of... I don't think it's just the British psyche, I think, general psyche, really, where some people go, well, I suppose there's, there's no smoke without fire. And so then, therefore, all of, all of a sudden, the public can get on board with a false uh, accusation. It was I mean, your as, world it was falling apart. It was, as my QC said, mm. uh, there can be smoke without yeah. fire. It's a big, gigantic smoke machine... <laughs> with the handle being turned by the Metropolitan Police and certain sections of yes. the media. And I took them on and beat them. Yes. And now I think that I am regarded in the media, or most sections of the media, um, and most people know what the truth is. No, exactly. But people know that side about you, Harvey, about the side of you being stoic and standing up, taking them on, winning. But what people won't have seen is what you were like when that front door closed and the noise stopped and you were so sat there on your own. What was that like? Oh. Quite horrendous. Are you OK to and, talk about it? And, and if anyone hasn't faced that sort of pressure, continuous pressure, day after day, it is horrendous. And so that is why I don't want anybody else to go through those sort of feelings oh. again. And that's why I try to help, where I can, those who have been falsely accused. I'm supporting an organisation called FAIR, um, Falsely Accused Individuals for Reform, because I think one important change needed in the law is to make sure that people, uh, um, suspects, have anonymity. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's important. Victims, the correct term should be complainants until the trial has taken place and a suspect has been found guilty. But complainants have anonymity. So should suspects and those alleged to have done things. Indeed. I, I mean, I, I'm inclined to agree with you on that. And the clamour for that is growing, actually, I think, as well. And what do you make, then, of... The police, because Cressida Dick has now fallen on her sword in a way, or resigned eventually, and they—I mean, they—they they, they really put you through the ringer there. I, I understand that you received some compensation, but I suppose you know, financial well, re financial remuneration cannot do cannot patch over the, the wounds. I suppose. Can it? Yes, but with very ill grace by right. the Metropolitan Police. Right. They even after the person who made the allegations, their star witness who they didn't want to investigate, 
have been found guilty of many charges of perverting the course of justice, even then the Metropolitan Police tried to defend themselves legally as though I was still the suspect. Yeah, sure. And so I had to fight, fight and fight again to get mediation and then within mediation to try to get fair recompense from the police. And even though I had great support, financial support from backers uh, and uh, good legal uh, support, the cost of Operation Midland to me, which I can't recoup, mm, mm. is half a million pounds. That is the cost Goodness of me. Operation Midland to me, half a million pounds. And, not... and it isn't, that, that half a million pounds is for nothing compared with the effect on yourselves, oh. your family and your friends. Yeah. It is horrendous. You lose friends over it. Are there people who cast you aside at the time and have maybe been a bit too embarrassed to, to come back or not? Yes. I'm not sure which is worse, those or those who were quiet when the going was tough. Yes. Exactly. And then when, of course, it was quite clear to everyone with the Enrique's report and with the trial that there was nothing in it at all, uh, trying to scramble their way back. Well, I'm sure you won't have forgotten that. It doesn't sound like you have, nor should you as well. We're, we're coming towards you now. But this has flown by. I could talk to you all evening. Do you stick around for a little bit because we're going to um, get some get a few questions from the public as well. But just before we, we start to move on to that, really, I wanted to get your take on the current crop, the current crop of MPs that we have at the moment. I think a lot of people feel very disenfranchised. A lot of people, frankly, don't really know what a lot of them stand for. What's your take on the current crop? Well, I'm sure that every ex-MP <laughs> is critical of those who come after. I place a lot of the blame for the diminishing standards of members of Parliament with Tony Blair, because Tony Blair changed the law to diminish the power of Parliament over the executive, over government, because he wanted a, yeah. an easy ride. And that meant, in part, quite noticeable changes to Parliament. Um, you can't speak for as long as you want in Parliament as you used to be able to do. Members of Parliament now are limited into the length of speeches that they can make in Parliament. Yeah. How does that show? Well, in the media, your programmes and others, mm. other channels, sound bites. Oh, yeah. They go for sound bites. Try to go beyond the sound bite. Yeah. They have no intellect to argue their case. No, I'm sick of it at all. You know, and actually, it's insulting to the public. You know, it's insulting to the public that they think, OK, I'll fob them off with, you know, this, this slogan, whatever it, whatever it is, or it's build back better. I mean, you could take your pick, couldn't you? And actually, we're better than that. We deserve better than that. We've got more, we've got more going on up here There than that. used to be a time. Mm when slogans inevitably came about in general elections. Now, yep. you have them day after day after day. You're relentless. Right. Thank you very much, Harvey. I have thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this. Cheers. You are uh, an absolute gentleman and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very, very much. There we go. Right. Yes, it's time for Barrage the Farage, where I answer your questions for Nigel. For one night only, though, of course, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, Chloe, you'll be glad to hear. Who wrote that? Uh, Chloe via Farage at GB News asks... Um, Har oh, Harvey's still with me, actually, so we might as well bring him in. Uh, Harvey opposed the call to boycott the Moscow Olympics of 1980. Do you back the Russia boycott now? What do you think? Yes, absolutely. Oh. Uh, Russia has become an international pariah on the world stage, and um, they should be um, excommunicated from the world. Yeah, OK, fair enough. What does Harvey think about sports stars, especially footballers, not feeling like that they can come out as gay? It's an well, eclectic uh, mix of questions here, Harvey. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's not just footballers. Yeah. Uh, I think people in the media have a role to play in this. Publishers, um, producers... Um, everyone uh, should, at the right time, when it's right for them, mm. come out and declare what they are. And I regret, I think, yeah. 
not doing it myself sooner. Harvey, thank you very, very much. And thank you all of you as well for my first solo flight on Farage. And he will be back, I believe, tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody who's been getting in touch. And yes, I'll see you all very soon. Take care.